morning. Two weeks ago, when we first met, the defendant Donald Smith was unknown to each of you and presumed by every one of you to be innocent. But that's changed. Collectively, unanimously, you've heard the horrific facts of this case and you've found him guilty of the crimes with which the state of the is charged. Now, the state of the trial is penalty. The state of Florida is asking you, each of you, to sentence him to the ultimate penalty on the law. And that is the death penalty. A couple weeks ago, I had the chance to talk to a sixth grade class, prayer day, about my job. And a sixth grader asked a really bright question. Is all homicide murder? You might think back to jury selection. We, we talked about that similar topic. And the answer is no. The killing of a human being, of another human being, can in some cases be accidental. And in some cases, it can be justifiable. It is not always murder. And under the law, all murders are in fact not first degree murders. And also under the law, all first degree murders do not warrant the death penalty. As Judge Cooper has just instructed you, only those murders in which the state proves beyond a reasonable doubt a first degree murder is aggravated is the penalty of death warranted. Last week, it was the burden of the state of Florida to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was guilty of the charges we brought. This week, it is our burden of proof to prove to you aggravation beyond a reasonable doubt. In this phase, we will focus on what makes this particular first degree murder aggravated. And just Judge Cooper just told you that you unanimously, in order to render a sentence of death, must unanimously agree that at least one aggravator has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. We submit to you six aggravators in this case. Two of which you have already found inherent in your verdict, three of which have already been proven by the evidence, and one that you will shortly learn about today. <coughs> the first two, the defendant was engaged in a kidnapping and sexual battery during the murder. If a murder is committed during the commission of certain felonies, the law recognizes this to be an aggravated factor. We have proven, and you have already found this in your verdict. <coughs> Two, the victim was less than 12 years of age. The law also recognizes that the murder of a child is an aggravating fa aggravated factor. And you and your verdict have also already found this aggravator. Three, the state submits that the murder was committed for the purpose of avoiding or preventing a lawful arrest. The law also recognizes as an aggravating factor that when a person murders another human being in order to eliminate them as a witness to their crimes, that murder is aggravated. The next two, cold, calculated, and premeditated, heinous, atrocious, and cruel. Likely, both aggravators that you've heard about in your lives. The first, CCP, cold, calculated, and premeditated. This is an aggravating factor that forces you to consider what his plans were, what his intent was. This aggravator forces you to consider what he went through. The evidence before you that we presented last week already proves this factor. The deception, the bundle of rope, that is the evidence I submit that proves cold, calculated, 
and premeditated. Heinous, atrocious, and cruel. The law says that the kind of crime intended to be included as especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel is one accompanied by additional acts that show that the crime was conscienceless or pitiless, was unnecessarily torturous to cherish periwinkle. The reason when the medical examiner testified that we submitted photographs of the injuries that facilitated her testimony to you is because, ladies and gentlemen, those pictures demonstrated what words could not do justice to in terms of the heinousness, the atrocity, and the cruelness of this murder. The testimony of Dr. Rao was that Cherish, quote, struggled through the entire process. She told you it took between three to five minutes for her to die. Tremendous force on her neck that she could not breathe. Cherish suffered swelling of her brain as a result of a lack of oxygen. In two photographs that we didn't publish to you, and that means show to you, but that we entered into evidence and are in that notebook, are the neck dissection. And they show two things that Dr. Rao testified to that go specifically to this aggravating factor. Her struggle was so intense and evidenced by the amount of hemorrhage that she bled in the strap mu muscles of her neck. And her voice box, her larynx, there's a photograph of it, the petechia that you saw in her face and in her eyes <clears throat> also was present on her voice box, her larynx. That evidence was the evidence that told the medical examiner and now you, about Cherish Periwinkle's struggle for the last minutes of her life. Her genital anatomy was, quote, totally destroyed. We will not be putting on new evidence today, in addition to what you've seen and heard, to prove heinous, atrocious, and cruel, or cold, calculated, and premeditated. The evidence is already before you in a matter of this record. But we will, however, shortly be putting on chilling testimony, a first-hand account of what it's like to be afraid of Donald Smith. You're going to meet shortly Carrie Ann Buck. She's now 37 years old. She lives in the state of New York in the snow belt. But she grew up here in Jacksonville. And in 1992, this defendant, Donald Smith, tried to kidnap her. She was 13. He was 36. She was walking down the street in her neighborhood when he solicited her. She kept walking. He was driving a van. He got out of his van and he chased her into a playground. She crawled up into a sliding plastic tube. You'll hear how she spread her little body like a spider in fear as he threatened her to come out of the tube. You'll hear from her that after that day when she was 13, she didn't leave her home again. She's the mother of four today. And her parenting, every day since her first born was born, has been informed by the paralyzing fear she will tell you about on that day in 1992. Don Smith was convicted of that crime, and he went to prison. And that last aggravator is one that the state submits to you. It's called prior violent felony. That is the sixth of the aggravators that we will prove beyond a reasonable doubt. <coughs> The judge will instruct you later in this trial about the process that you will undergo to determine your sentence. And while there is no mathematical equation, 
that you must undertake. It is a weighing process where you determine the weight, the substance of the aggravation, and you compare it to mitigation. In jury selection, you'll remember that one of you um, mentioned that they, he or she, would like to know more about Donald Smith. We expect that you will hear from doctors, neurologists, and neuropsychiatrists over the next two days. And we expect that these doctors, that the defense will put on, will tell you that Donald Smith has brain damage. We expect these doctors are going to tell you that he has impulse control problems. We expect they will tell you about Donald Smith's history. We expect that they will blame the system. We expect them to prove to you that since 1977, Donald Smith has been committing sexually deviant and deceptive crimes. They will be offering this to you, we expect, as mitigation for the murder of Cherish Perry Winkle. The law you will hear, we learned it in jury selection, we discussed it after jury selection, and you will be instructed on it again before you deliberate. Neither compels nor requires you to determine that the defendant be sentenced to death. The question before you is whether the aggravation in this case, once fully proven, whether it is sufficient to warrant this most ultimate penalty. And ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the state of Florida, I submit to you that it is. <laughs>